The money we put down to purchase that video or that magazine goes directly into organized crime activities. Murder, extortion, prostitution. Are you struggling with compulsive masturbation? Do you wish you could gain control in this area of your life, but you just don't know how? The photo will not reject me, will not humiliate me, will always smile at me and think I'm sexually wonderful and masterful. What we're looking for is people who are dependent upon God, not themselves, who don't see the answer as, oh, here's a new technique, try that, but to see the see Christian counseling essentially as an encounter with God. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is David Kyle Foster, and I'm your host for today's program. Today we're going to look at the issue of pornography and other forms of immoral, sexually addictive behavior. With the help of co-host Jason Graves and others, I'm going to address some of the common questions that arise when people are faced with their own sinful and out of control behavior. We're going to take a look at what the Bible says about pornography and masturbation, not only in its prohibitions, but in its remedy as well. So sit back and relax and explore with us God's will and God's solution for the person bound in sexual sin. What's so wrong with pornography anyway? It's not hurting anyone, is it? Well, the idea that pornography is a victimless crime is nonsense. I know, I was involved not only in purchasing pornography, but also in allowing my home to be used by pornographers to film their movies. I knew the producers, the directors, and the actors, and it's not a pretty picture from any angle. The industry is dominated by organized crime. The children, teenagers, and adults who are used in pornography have had their lives utterly destroyed. You have to have received a seriously damaged view of yourself to be driven to take your clothes off for the camera. Many have been kidnapped, drugged, and gang raped. Others have been so abused at home and by the men who control them that they will do anything they're told just to keep from being beaten up again, just to get that fix of crack cocaine again just to have an authority figure tell them they're okay one more time. Just off camera from those smiling faces is a pimp who makes certain that they keep smiling. I know, I've stood off camera and watched it all. This is no victimless crime and we are not innocent consumers of their wares. The money we put down to purchase that video or that magazine goes directly into organized crime activities, murder, extortion, prostitution, and we are financing it. Do you really believe that you will escape responsibility for providing the money for such evil activities? Our own judicial system will give you the answer. No, you will not. You and I are accessories to such crimes by virtue of having provided the means. Our only hope is in repenting of our sin and throwing ourselves on the mercy of God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. Your only escape is to turn from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus Christ so that He can take the punishment on Himself. That is His offer to you. And as you live in relationship with Him, He will fill your mind and heart with visions of glory, of holiness, and the beauty of His purity. As the song says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Are you struggling with pornography? Is this something that you wish wasn't in your life, but you just can't seem to conquer it? Well, you're definitely not alone. Personally, I can relate with that trapped feeling, and our heart is in the right place if we want to live free from the lust that pornography elicits. In fact, our desire for sex is good. That's the innate desire God created within us as human beings. Uh, pointing that desire in the wrong direction, as you've probably found out if you keep going back to porn again and again, only leads to bondage and a lack of fulfillment. 
uh, there are a few key things to realize and steps to take. First, I had to realize that this is not just a spiritual issue. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, be sanctified body, mind, and spirit. So it would have been a mistake to just keep praying about this or just reading my Bible more or talking to my pastor. All of these were good things for me to do, but I had to take a broader approach. Now, whenever temptation comes around, I start by asking myself, what am I feeling? I do a quick self-assessment with the word HALTS, H-A-L-T-S, which stands for nine things. Write these down. It's hungry, angry, lonely, tired, sick, sad, stressed, scared, and shameful. Now, these feelings and emotions are really just the undercurrents of lust and porn temptation. Once we've memorized halts and can identify what we're feeling deep down inside at the moment, we can choose to meet the valid need that the feeling represents instead of placating or trying to numb that need with lust and pornography. Try it, it works. Pick out your most common trigger feeling and create an action plan for yourself this goes something like this. When I feel blank, I need to blank. It could sound something like this, for example. When I feel lonely, I need to connect with a friend. Or when I feel stressed, uh, I need to do some extra exercising or deep breathing or something like that. You just fill in the blank with something healthy that you know in advance will help you when things get tough. From there, it's simply just a matter of practice. Now, the next thing to do is cut yourself off from the supply. Uh, I had to take the Bible seriously when it said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. It's not talking literally, but about a radical amputation of sin in our lives. We can help this in two ways. If you use uh, internet, for example, make sure you have a good content filter that also provides accountability reporting, not one or the other. Also, regardless of the form of porn you use, make sure your life is in the light with at least two other people that you're committed to and that are committed to you, and they can help you on a daily or at least a weekly basis to fight this temptation in your life. In fact, it's preferable to find a group of people who struggle similarly uh, rather than just depend on one accountability partner. We're, remember, uh, created with a body, mind, and a spirit, so we need to care for ourselves in all three areas, especially when it comes to fighting the temptation of lust and pornography. We cannot do it alone. No man is an island. So be smart and be brave, and don't forget, if thousands of people in recovery like me can live in victory with God's help and the help of other warriors, so can you, my friend. Until next time, this is Jason Graves with tips for hope and healing for Pure Passion Television. Pure Passion. Every once in a while, a book comes along that gathers together the very best counsel and advice for those who struggle with unholy sexual desires. Ted Roberts has written just such a book. It's called Pure Desire, How One Man's Triumph Can Help Others Break Free from Sexual Temptation. In this brilliant and classic book on sex addiction, Roberts writes about the wounded heart of the sex addict, the sin of idolatry, the cleansing hope of vision, the process of healing and God's imparted strength in the midst of an ongoing battle. His wife even writes a chapter about the struggle of the spouse of the sex addict and also included our testimonies and suggested resources. So if you or someone you love or someone you're counseling struggles with sexual addiction, Pure Desire can be an anchor amid rough waters and the offer of a new appreciation for Christ's healing power and presence. The time is now to begin walking in victory and helping others to do the same. To get your copy of Pure Desire, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. How does pornography work to destroy God's holy design for sexual relations? Well, in short, it distorts the image of God in sexuality. It creates impure motivations for expressing our sexual urges. It tempts the heart to go after the forbidden, private areas of another's body, areas meant only for the pleasure of their spouse. It blocks off true intimacy, which is the intended foundation for sexual expression by sending the mind and heart into a netherworld of self-centered lust and perversion. 
You see, when a person looks at pornography, they become inflamed with the lust for the person in the picture. A person who happens to be real, with a real mom and dad, a real life, and who has been created in the image of God. They've crossed that first boundary forbidden by God in Matthew 5, lusting after someone in their heart. In God's eyes, they are committing adultery or some other sin with that person. What makes such temptations even more compelling is that when we cross that first line of sin, by virtue of that act of rebellion against God, we give Satan the right to ensnare us, to throw us into bondage to lust. We empower him and give him permission to build a stronghold in us. Another thing that may contribute to my bondage is insecurity, a fear of the sort of people represented in the pornographic images. If I am afraid of rejection by a certain kind of person, then it may seem safer for me to lust after their image in a photo rather than in person. This would be especially true if it were the kind of person who I would have no hope of having in real life. You see, the photo will not reject me, will not humiliate me, will always smile at me and think I'm sexually wonderful and masterful. The picture allows me to weave a fantasy and to generate pleasure with that fantasy that I am convinced I could never have with the actual person. The focus is me and what will give me the most pleasure. And I am using the person in that picture to serve my selfish needs. I need to grow up. I need to discipline myself to go to God to quench my fears of other people rather than seeking false intimacy through idolatrous pseudo-relationships. I need to renounce my selfishness, my subservience to fear, my dismissive attitudes toward those whose lives are being destroyed in the porn industry. I need to seek forgiveness for having turned real people into idols for my own pleasure. I need to learn how to pull down idols of lust by using my authority in Christ if I'm a Christian. I need to engage God's power to destroy such strongholds, to implore Him to replace those idols with healthy concepts of sexuality, to receive a healthy perspective of men and women, to see them as God sees them, made in His image. I need to ask God to give me His eyes and His mind to recreate in me a healthy sexuality. Are you struggling with compulsive masturbation? Do you wish you could gain control in this area of your life, but you just don't know how? Well, you are definitely not alone. In fact, the Bible says, No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. Indeed, studies show that 98-99% to 99 of all men have masturbated in their lifetime. Listen to what famous Christian author C.S. Lewis said about it. I'll paraphrase what he wrote. He said, for me, the real evil of masturbation would be that it takes an appetite in which, in lawful use, leads the individual out of himself to complete his own personality in that of another and turns it back, sends the man back into the prison of himself, there to keep a harem of imaginary images. And this harem, once admitted, works against his ever getting out and uniting with a real person. For the harem is always accessible, subservient, calls for no sacrifices or adjustments, and can be endowed with erotic and psychological attractions which no real person can rival. Among those shadowy images, he is always adored, always the perfect love. No demand is made on his unselfishness, no mortification ever imposed on his vanity. In the end, they become merely the medium through which he increasingly adores himself. Wow, what a powerful concept. And you may be thinking, well, I've never really heard it put that way before. Well, let me give you a few more things to think about having been down the road of recovery in this area myself. Tips that will give you hope and a vision for walking in purity. First, I had to address the way I thought about sex. I had to accept that the Bible is clear on God's design for sex and how it's meant to be between one man and one woman in a marriage. This is really the only model that fulfills God's ultimate creative intent for the sexual union, and that is to mirror His image. So, obviously, masturbation doesn't really fit into that picture from a biblical perspective. So, once I accepted this biblical reality, 
I was able to start receiving the fullness of God's help available to me, realizing that this is not just a spiritual issue. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, be sanctified body, mind, and spirit. So I had to stop thinking I could just pray about this or just reading my Bible more or talking to my pastor. Now all of these were helpful and wise things for me to do, but I had to go beyond just the spiritual approaches and start asking myself, what am I feeling in here? And doing a quick self-assessment using the word HALTS. H-A-L-T-S stands for nine things. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, sick, sad, stressed, scared, and shameful. These feelings and emotions represent the undercurrents of lust and masturbation temptation. And once we've memorized halts and can identify what we're feeling on the inside, we can choose to meet those valid needs and the feelings they represent instead of trying to numb or medicate those needs with lust and masturbation. You can try it too. Choose your most common trigger off of that list and create an action plan for yourself that completes this phrase. When I feel blank, I need to blank. It could sound something like this, for example. When I feel angry, I need to vent to a friend. Or when I feel tired, I just need to take a nap or just rest and relax a bit. You simply fill in the blanks with something positive that you know today will help you when times get tough down the road. After using halts over time, self-care is like riding a bike. It comes naturally and you can almost do it without thinking much. Well, I hope this helps and brings you hope. Remember, when it comes to living in sexual purity, free from masturbation, it's about acknowledging God's intent for sex in marriage, honoring our true feelings in a self-caring way, and realizing that we can't do this alone. So be wise and be honest. And don't forget, if thousands of people in recovery like me can live in victory with God's help and the help of other warriors, so can you, my friend. How can someone get free from a bondage to pornography? Well, first of all, we need to acknowledge it as the evil that it is and declare all out war with no prisoners. Repent of having financed the destruction of the lives of those in the pornography that you've purchased. Ask for, receive, and accept God's forgiveness. Ask God to motivate you by the love that He poured out for you on the cross. Destroy all materials and avoid the places and districts and environments that sell it. Set your heart against pornography by making an irrevocable decision that using it will never again be an option in your life. Now understand that in order for this to operate properly, you still need to go to God when tempted for His power and you need to be committed to obeying whatever He might ask of you when you turn to Him. Set an angelic or divine guard or bouncer at the door of your mind to expel the enemy when he comes. He fights for you every time you really want him to. See temptation as an opportunity for growth in righteousness and spiritual maturity. For with every temptation, God provides a way out so that you will grow in Christ-likeness and commitment to holiness through the battle. Ask God to give you a healthy perspective of the sexuality of others, to see them as God sees them. Reverse the forsaken idolatry with regular worship and praise of who God is. Let Him become the greater pleasure in your life. And as you praise Him, ask God to transmit into you wholeness and emotional health. He can do that supernaturally. Enter into relationship with the Father through regular communion with Him. Listen for and obey His revelations. Ask God to set you free from any demonic strongholds that may have taken root as a result of viewing pornography and to fill the remaining void with His Holy Spirit. Your passion that beats for Christ alone. Did you know that pornography is a $100 billion a year industry worldwide that dominates our mainstream media? Porn is changing the way we see ourselves and how we act toward each other. To help change that, we're offering the book Porn Nation, Conquering America's Number One Addiction by Michael Leahy. 
In Porn Nation, Michael tells his story of spending over 30 years as a porn addict, made even worse by his discovery of internet porn, the crack cocaine of sexual addiction. Michael talks about really wanting to get well and describes how God heals the body by changing the mind and heals the soul by changing the heart. Are you a user of pornography? Do you know someone who is? Porn Nation offers a wake-up call to the nation and to individuals who have become mesmerized by the siren song of erotic images and fantasies found in pornography. To get your copy of Porn Nation, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. In my second book, The Bondage Breaker, I, I, I first laid out and made public what we call the Steps to Freedom in Christ. The theory behind it is really quite simple. I mean, the Lord said, repent and believe, and we have great opportunities to grow in our faith, books everywhere telling us what we should believe, etc. But few opportunities to repent, and in a lot of cases, not even quite sure how to do that. I don't say that naively, folks. I do doctrine and ministry classes, and, and all the people who come have got a Master's of Divinity, and so they've, they've taken the original languages. And, and you look at the core message of the church, what Jesus told us to do, repent and believe, you would think there would be a uniform concept of how one should repent. Uh, but unfortunately, there really isn't. And, uh, and so I, I, I came with the same dilemma when I be, first began to teach at Telba School of Theology. And over the years I realized, I said, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So somehow or another, God has to be part of this process because He's the one who grants repentance. And so the basis for, the, for a lot of our recovery ministry today is 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's bondservant must be kind, able to teach, patient with wrong. And what we're looking for is people who are dependent upon God, not themselves, who don't see the answer as, oh, here's a new technique, try that, but to see, the, see Christian counseling essentially as an encounter with God. So what I came up with at that time was is that what is keeping me from having an intimate relationship with God? And I had to go back to the Old Testament to look clearly. And one of them clearly is false guidance. If I have been falsely guided in my life, if I've dabbled into the occult or the occult in some way, then I need to take care of that. Because in the Old Testament, if you were a medium or a spiritist, you were to be stoned to death. Uh, if you consulted them, you were to be cut off. Well, I don't want to be cut off from the people. so. We deal with that first in our Steps to Freedom because if there has been some occultic or occultic background, I need to get rid of that first because if the process is going to be contested by the evil one, then let's take care of that right off the bat. Then we look at deception and what ways I've been deceived because deception really is the major problem. And uh, a lot of you th are thinking right now, well, no, I think the big one is temptation. I'm tempted. And I said, well, if I tempted you, you would know it. But he's also the accuser of the brethren. But if I accused you, you would know it. And you've been accused. I know you have because if you, he tempts you to sin and you do it, then the accuser's role comes into play immediately. You jerk, why are you doing that? You know, you know, how can you call your sister and Christian self a Christian continue to do that? And so you feel this condemnation come upon you. But the real battle is deception. And, the, and that's the real battle because if I tempted you, you know it. If I accused you, you'd know it. If I deceived you, you wouldn't know it. And you say, boy, now there's a new thought. Is it really? Eve was deceived and she believed a lie. Well, I'm a good person. Eve, did, when she was deceived, had never sinned yet. So don't tell me good people can't be deceived. We all can be. And even in the high priestly prayer in John 17, he says, I ask not that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. How? Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. And so the whole issue uh, of recovery is to get people back into that righteous relationship with God. So deal with the false guidance, deal with the deception, but deal with the need to forgive others. Even if you look at the 12 uh, step recovery program, which I'm not here to, to be critical of at all, there's a step to go seek forgiveness because you probably have offended somebody else, but unless you add it, there's not a, a step in there to forgive others. And I'm here to tell you right now, that is the biggest issue that exists between most believers and their Heavenly Father. If you don't forgive from your heart, God will turn you over to the tormentors. And so this is a very, very critical step. And, and over the years in helping people really find their freedom in Christ, the need to forgive others has been typically the top one they need to work through. But there's also pride, there's also rebellion, and then there's the entrapment of sin. And uh, I talked to you earlier about that. And so we're looking at flesh patterns that I keep recurring in my life, and so I need to confess those as well. But for sexual problems, then we have them pray. Uh, 
and ask the Lord to reveal every sexual use of their body as an instrument of unrighteousness. And God does that. And then as they go through that, Lord, I renounce having sex with so-and-so. I ask you to break that bond. And then finally, we just commit our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. And unfortunately, the, the last step is things that have been held over from previous generations. Iniquities are passed on uh, to the third and the fourth generation. And you're never guilty for your parents' sin. But because your parents did sin, the chances are you've picked up some of those issues probably mostly from the environment, but it's also a spiritual connection. And I've just seen that cycle of abuse go on all around the world. And so these are not seven simple little steps that you go through. Really, it's a, it's a process by which I have the person I'm trying to work with, have them actually pray. God shows them. I don't have to point out their sin to them. God will do that. And people, by and large, don't lie to God. As they go through the process, they really remove the barriers to their intimacy with God. And once they're connected back to God, then the life of Christ can flow through them. And now they have a working man's chance at winning that battle for their mind. I believe, and I'm yet to find you know, problems in people's life that don't fit under you know, one of those seven. And the first one really is dealing again with false guidance. In what way have I dabbled into the occult or the, the cult? And then there's deception itself. What way have I been deceived by the world or deceived myself or hanging on to uh, mental strongholds that, that continue to plague me in my life or defense mechanisms I don't need anymore because Christ is my defense. The third one is overcoming bitterness in my life and by forgiving others from my heart, and then pride, and then rebellion, and then continuing sin in my life that I struggle with, uh, primarily sexual sins. And then lastly, uh, iniquities have been passed on third and fourth generation. And I can confess and renounce those and, and truly find our freedom in Christ. I hope that we have brought you hope today with our commentaries and our counsel. It's not easy getting extracted from the devil's prison once you've given yourself over to sexual immorality. The road can be tough and require a great deal of sacrifice and learning of new ways to live, but it's worth every moment spent. The ultimate answer to the problem of pornography, masturbation, and other sexually addictive behaviors is to divert your focus and attention to the love of God poured out for you on the cross of Calvary and available to you every day through an intimate relationship with Almighty God. He doesn't hate you. He's not ashamed of you. He loves you dearly and wants nothing more than what is best for you. And he gave his very best in the person of Jesus Christ, who not only died to pay the penalty for your sin, but rose from the grave with great power and authority, a power that he will make available to anyone who will give their life to Jesus Christ. Yes, the power that you need to walk in holiness can only be found in and through Him. So get acquainted with the true lover of your soul and keep watching Pure Passion. See you next week.